I invite you to take your Bibles and open to the book of Acts, chapter 6 and verse number 1. Acts 6 and verse 1. We're going to be looking at this passage as we get into our study this morning. It's an important day for us here at the White House. Every first day of the week is important, obviously, because we're able to assemble and worship our God. Uh, but today is especially important for us because we're going to appoint two men to serve this congregation as elders. And in order to do that, we've spent uh, some time past several weeks talking about and studying about, especially in our Bible class, the qualifications of elders. We've talked about the work that they are to do, the words that the Bible uses to describe uh, these men and their office and, and their function. And uh, we studied a couple weeks ago some lessons about elders as uh, shepherds, as watchmen, and having vision as, as leaders. And now we come to the end of that process. We've had a couple of weeks to uh, consider these two men and the characteristics of their life along with the qualifications of Scripture. And now the time has come to uh, appoint them and to recognize them as uh, elders. So in order to do that, the Bible gives us, you know, there's not a specific example about appointing elders in the Bible, but it does give us some ideas that we're going to read here in Acts chapter 6 and we're going to follow uh, according to those. But I want to start by reminding you of the words of Titus 1 in verse 5, where Paul says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou mayest or thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. The word appointed at the end of that verse means commanded. Paul had commanded Titus, one of his responsibilities as a preacher of the gospel was to set in order things that were lacking in congregations. And one of those things was uh, that was lacking was elders, eldership. And so in order for Titus to fulfill his role as a preacher, he had to educate, teach congregations, Christians, the word of God, the qualifications of elders, the work of elders, so that men could be found that met those qualifications and that would commit to and perform that work so they could be ordained elders in every congregation. And so it was an important role that he played as a preacher in teaching people what, what God says about this and then in recognizing these men before the congregation. And we're going to do that today, but I want to note with you that that word ordain has been misused by many in the religious world. When we even use that word or we talk about ordination, we automatically almost think about you know, some elaborate ceremony that we see in the denominational world. But that word simply means to designate or to appoint, to place or to set. And so it's the idea of placing a person in a position. And there doesn't have to be any elaborate ceremony involved with that. Now in the Old Testament, there was a lot of ceremony and a lot of ritual because that law was designed to focus on the physical and the material to teach spiritual lessons. So you think about a person being ordained as a priest under the old covenant, you know, there was a lot of ritual with the animal sacrifice and the anointing of oil and the blood on the right earlobe and the thumb and the big toe and all of those things. But we don't read about any of that in the New Testament. In fact, the New Testament, in the New Testament, simplicity is the pattern always for the New Testament church. So even though there's no specific pattern given about appointing elders, there are three things that seem to be involved in this process that we learn from Acts chapter 6. I want to briefly mention those, and then we will uh, get about the business of recognizing and appointing these men as, as elders. So in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, the Bible says, In those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So the first thing we notice here in the process of 
ordaining people to an office, the first step was teaching. So the congregation needed to understand what was being done. So the apostles instructed them, here is the problem that we're facing, here's the solution to the problem, and we need men to serve in order to remedy this, this situation. So they told them what was going on, they taught them the qualifications of the men to be chosen, and here they were to be of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. They were told of the expectations, what the work was that they were to do. This was so the congregation could then look among them and see if there were individuals who met those qualifications and were able to do that work and willing to do that work. And so the congregation needed to know those things. Those who were being selected needed to know what the qualifications were and what would be required of them. So the first step in choosing people to serve in, in such a way was teaching. And that's what we've been doing for several weeks and, and you know what we're continually doing as we study God's word we're teaching and, and learning what God wants from us and expects of us and so we've talked about qualifications and work and, and all of those things and that's the first step of the process secondly there's prayer look at verses 5 and 6 the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose and we have the list of these men including Stephen and I'll read him because it says a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And then you have Philip and the others. Verse 6 says, Whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And so the second thing was prayer. Prayer is always appropriate. But in this case, of course, it is essential. We need to remember that we are involved in the Lord's work and because of that, we must involve him in what we're doing. Um, we dare not try to do the Lord's work and leave the Lord out of it. And the only way for us as Christians to involve the Lord in our lives and in our efforts and in our work is by letting him speak to us through his word, so we read and study, and by us speaking to him through prayer. And so prayer is essential. If we want to be successful in the work of the Lord, he needs to be a part of that work, and so we need to be praying about it in order to be successful and, of course, to do the Lord's will. Often in the New Testament, prayers joined with fasting. Acts 13, 2 and 3 is just one example of that, and it's entirely appropriate, again, to skip a meal in order to focus oneself on spiritual things and to pray about momentous occasions and important decisions such as this. And so we've been praying about it. We've prayed about it publicly from the pulpit. Other members in their public prayers have prayed for it. I hope we've been praying about it privately, about this decision and, and this step that we're taking, because prayer involves the Lord in the process. And, of course, we pray to him for wisdom to make right decisions and all of those things. And we're going to pray again in just a few moments as, as a part of this process. And then the third step is there at the end of verse 6, it says they laid their hands on them. So the third thing involved in appointing men to, to office is the laying on of hands. Now, sometimes in the New Testament, this refers to the imparting of miraculous abilities to others by the apostles. We see that in Acts chapter 8 when uh, Philip preached in the city of Samaria. They obeyed the gospel and became Christians but they hadn't received the Holy Ghost. They didn't have miraculous gifts. So Peter and John came down from Jerusalem and laid hands on them, and they were given the Holy Spirit and the ability to work miracles. So sometimes that's what laying on of hands refers to. That's not what it's referring to here, and we know that because Stephen was a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. He already had the Holy Spirit, he already had the ability to do miracles. So when he became a Christian, the apostles had already laid hands on him. So when they laid their hands on him, they weren't giving him miraculous gifts. He already had those. So this laying on of hands has to do with something different. And what it is, is simply a means of endorsement or approval, showing fellowship. And I want to read from uh, 1 Timothy 5, just a couple of verses that helped to illustrate this for us. And in this context, Paul is talking about elders as well. 
and he talks about several different things concerning them that we won't take the time to read now, but we'll look at in just a moment. But at the end of this passage, he says to Timothy, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. And just before he told him that, in verse 21, he gave him a charge. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. And he's talking about their receiving an accusation against an elder, but it also applies in the other relationships that Timothy would have with the elders. There was not to be partiality. So you don't select someone to be an elder because they're your buddy or your friend or your cousin or family member or whatever. It's because they meet the qualifications whether you're close to them or not. And the same is true of an accusation. If they've done wrong, then they've done wrong, and you can't be partial in addressing that. So he tells them that it must be done without partiality, but also not hastily. Lay hands suddenly on no man. Well, what does that mean? He's not talking about imparting gifts because Timothy was not an apostle. He couldn't impart spiritual gifts to others. Laying hands meant approving of someone, giving your endorsement of them, showing you're in fellowship with them. Because if you don't know a person, if you haven't looked at their life and see if they meet the qualifications, right, and are doing the, the work and living that way, and, and then you endorse them and they go astray, well, then you become partaker in that. And so he's warning Timothy about being hasty in those kinds of decisions. But that's what the laying on of hands has to do with. And so, again, that's not some elaborate ritual, but it's something that's a part of this process. And we've talked about this before. Something as simple as shaking hands will do. And so what we're going to do is, with, with these two men who will become elders, we're going to pray about the decision and pray for them. And then they will shake hands with the other men who are serving us as elders, which will be the laying on of hands showing their approval and their endorsement of this decision and of these men to serve the congregation as elders. And by doing so, we will have followed this pattern in Acts chapter 6, and these men will become elders of the congregation. So we're going to, to do that now, and then we're going to come back and, and talk briefly at the end about the second part of our lesson about our relationship uh, to the elders. So we're going to have a word of prayer, and then after that we will, uh, uh, we will appoint these men as elders. So if you will, bow with me. Our most kind and gracious and holy and righteous Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful for the opportunity that we have as thy children to come together to worship thee, to study thy word, and we're thankful for the Bible. We're thankful for the teaching of Scripture, for its simplicity, that you've instructed us in how to uh, live and how to behave in the house of God, in the church of the living God, that we can know your plans and your purposes for us. And we're thankful that we have this occasion before us today to appoint two men to serve this congregation as elders. We're thankful for our current elders and for their wisdom in looking to the future and thinking about this congregation and its continual existence and their desire to have good leaders for days and for years to come. And we're thankful for the two men who have been selected to be elders of this congregation, for Joe Faircloth and for Udon Mays for their years of service and hard work in thy son's kingdom, for the good example of their lives. We're thankful for their desire to serve, their will willingness to take this responsibility upon themselves. We pray that you'll bless them as they enter into this work, that they will have hearts that are devoted to thee and to thy truth, that they'll ever stand for it faithfully and loyal to thy word and to thy son, that they'll seek to lead in a way that is pleasing to thee and always in harmony with thy will, that they'll look to the flock as shepherds, with a desire to save souls and to help us make it to that eternal home in heaven. We pray that you'll bless them with wisdom, bless them with strength and courage and boldness, and bless all our elders as they serve and lead us, that we will always be headed in the right direction toward that eternal home of heaven. We're so thankful for thy son, for the sacrifice that he made on the cross to purchase our forgiveness from our sins and to purchase the church with that blood. Thankful that we can be members of it, and that we can be a part of a family that seeks to serve thee and, and to live together in peace and harmony here on the earth 
and forever in that eternal home in heaven. Bless us in our efforts this day. We pray that all that we do will be pleasing unto thee. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to ask uh, these two men, Joe Faircloth and Udon Mays, if they will, to step forward and come before the congregation. And uh, we're going to say a couple of words, and then they will uh, shake hands with our elders, and they will be appointed as, uh, as elders of this congregation. So if, you do, if you'll do that now. <clears throat> Joe Faircloth and Udon Mays, after consideration from the eldership and from the congregation, uh, today, you are to be set apart to serve this congregation as elders. Um, you're known by us, by the congregation, by your fellow men, to be men of integrity and faithfulness to the Lord. Your character and example have demonstrated that you're men of devotion and of diligence. And you've proven that you have a love for the church and a heart of a servant by your years of labor uh, in the congregation as song leaders, as teachers, and, and as deacons as well. And our prayer for you is that as you have in the past, you'll continue to serve the Lord and his church well. We know that this is a serious responsibility. It comes with many challenges, but it also carries with it great rewards. So we charge you before Almighty God to approach this work with gravity and with sobriety, to conduct it prayerfully and faithfully, and in all things to strive to honor God with your service. So as you shake hands with the elders of this congregation, we recognize and appoint you as elders of the White House Church of Christ. Appreciate you men taking on this responsibility and appreciate our good elders uh, also. I want us to take a few moments for the time that we have left to remind us as a congregation of the responsibility that we have uh, toward the elders and toward the eldership. And we understand that it's not one elder, but it's a plurality and, and they have authority as an eldership, but we have responsibilities toward them as well that we need to, uh, to consider. So if you'll turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5, we're going to notice a couple of things here, and then we'll look at that passage in 1 Timothy uh, 5 and bring these thoughts to a close. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse number 12, Paul says, We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And there are some things in that verse that talk about, you know, the work of elders, that they labor among you, they are working, they're over you, meaning they have oversight, and they admonish you, meaning they teach you. But we're also told in that verse that we, as a congregation, have a responsibility to them. And the first thing we notice is that we must know the elders. We beseech you to know them which are among you. And so we have to know who our elders are, and that's obvious. We need to know who the men are who are serving as elders. But more than that, this word means that we are to be acquainted with them. And the idea is that we know them enough and know them well enough that we're able to go to them for advice or for instruction when we're seeking wisdom. The responsibility of elders is to, to be overseers of the congregation. They're shepherds of the flock. And so when we're in trouble physically but especially spiritually, they are the men to whom we can go and, and seek counsel and advice. And it's something that we as a congregation, not just that we need to be aware of it, but it's what we need to do and what we need to practice. Many times people go to the preacher. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you know, the preacher may, may have insight on scripture as well, but the elders are the overseers. They, they watch for our souls. And so we need to know them and to be comfortable to go to them in times of need. But this word also means to recognize or to observe, uh, which carries two ideas. One is that we are looking at them as examples, so we're observing their life to pattern and model our lives after because they're faithfully serving the Lord. And it also, excuse me, means to have regard for. And so we respect them for their work and for their service in the Lord's kingdom. So we have to know the elders. 
Secondly, in verse 13, he says, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now, this is an interesting phrase. The word esteem means to consider or to account. And so, again, we are, are looking at them, we know them, and uh, we're considering them. But he says to esteem them very highly in love. That phrase, very highly, you know, in John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus, as the good shepherd, talks about the thief. And he says, the thief comes to kill and steal and destroy. But he says, I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. <clears throat> and that word for more abundantly is the idea of when, when something is abundant, you know, your basket is, is full. More abundantly means that the basket is full, and then you just stack on top of it to where it's starting to, to run over the sides. That's more abundant. Super abundant is the idea of the Greek. Well, this word, when he says more highly or very highly, it means above that which is super abundant. So you have the basket that's full, and then you pile onto it till it's overflowing, and then you know someone dumps a dump truck full on it, and it's just overflowing even more. That's this word. And Paul says that is to be our esteem for the elders, for their work's sake. We're to have an affection for them and a love for them because we recognize the responsibility that they have taken on their shoulders for us. They are watching for our souls. They're guiding us to heaven. And so we are to esteem them very highly in love. We love them for the work that they do on our behalf. And so it's important for elders to do the work that they're supposed to do, but when they're doing that work, the congregation owes them love and affection and support. And one of the ways that that is demonstrated is the last part of this verse where he says, and be at peace among yourselves. That's the third thing that we owe the elders, peace. In the congregation, we need to be striving to be at peace. Um, the elders have enough to worry about with, you know, attacks that come from the devil and with the threat of false teaching and with all the things that go on in, in the world and in the spiritual realm. It's, it's not good for us to add to their worries with some petty disagreement that we may have among ourselves in a congregation. How many times, you know, does that become a problem that elders have to deal with to try to keep the congregation from splitting because so-and-so got mad at so-and-so because this person hurt their feelings or whatever, and these petty, silly things become, you know, big problems that weigh upon the shoulder of, of elders. We as Christians, because we love them and respect them and understand the work that they're doing, we try to maintain peace among ourselves. And we do that not just for the elders, Paul's emphasizing that here, but we do it first and foremost for the Lord. The church is his body, and how dare we tear his body apart because of some silly disagreement or difference that we have. Right? So we need to be at peace for the Lord's sake and also because of our love of the elders. So those are three things that we owe the eldership as a congregation. The fourth comes from Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7. Here the writer of Hebrews says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. So we must remember the elders. And not just remember them, but imitate them, whose faith follow, he says. The word mem remember means to exercise the memory, to recall, to recollect. We understand that idea, and, you know, sometimes we talk about our, our memory is going, and sometimes things happen physically that we can't help that, but sometimes it's, it's just that we're not exercising our memory. When it comes to the elders, we are to exercise our memory to remember them to think on them and to think about their work and their service so it means to be mindful of them of their teaching of their example you know of, of the work that they do but also of the example that they set so we can learn from them we can follow them and we can imitate them 
they are leaders of the congregation, we must follow them. And we do that by remembering them. And if you look at verse 17 of Hebrews 13, he says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And so we are to obey the elders, to submit to the elders. The word obey means, literally means to be persuaded to yield or to comply with. And so we are persuaded to yield to their leadership because of their care for us. They watch for your souls. And so I'm going to follow their direction because I know they're looking out for me for what is best for me and for my eternal soul. So when the elders say that we're going to assemble on Sunday evenings, if I submit to the elders and I follow their leadership, then I'm going to assemble. When they say we're going to meet in the middle of the week for Bible study, we follow their leadership and we assemble to study because they're doing that not it's not for them you know because they want to just have the congregation come together it's because they're watching for our souls that's why we have gospel meetings and vacation bible schools and, and all of those things they're looking out for our souls and so we submit to them and obey their instructions obviously in harmony with uh, with the will of god and so that's what this passage has to do with submit means to yield it means to surrender uh, to resist no longer. So we submit to them because we recognize their responsibility that they have taken upon themselves for us. And so that's something that we owe to the eldership. And then lastly, we're going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, as we mentioned a moment ago, and uh, look at what Paul says here that leads up to that verse we noted just a little bit ago. 1 Timothy 5 and verse um, 17 <clears throat> He says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So we must honor the elders. And what he says here is that elders who do a good job, who rule well, who are you know, living and serving in harmony with God's instructions, that they are deserving of double honor, twofold uh, honor. Literally, this has to do with elders being paid for their work. Verse 18 shows that. The scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. <clears throat> Paul uses those verses also in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, to talk about paying the preacher. Right. So in the first century, you had full-time elders who literally devoted themselves and their lives full-time to shepherding the congregation. So on a daily basis, they were, you know, doing the work of an elder, visiting those who were sick and those who were wayward, and all of those things involved in, in serving as an elder. And because of that, the church supported them in that work. And Paul says that one who does it well deserves a raise, and not just a raise, but to double his pay. And that's literally what he's talking about. Uh, so you can understand why one of the qualifications is not being greedy of filthy lucre when you had elders who were being, you know, paid for that. And there's absolutely nothing wrong, you know, with that. If we had full-time elders today who, you know, that was their means of a livelihood, there, there's nothing wrong with them being paid. But the point here is that it emphasizes our honor toward them uh, because we support them in that work. So even if elders are not paid, the congregation should uh, honor them. And this is because of their faithfulness, because of their dedication, not just because of their office, they're in this position, but because they're faithful in serving in that position. He then says in verse 19, Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. And so the congregation owes the eldership um, the benefit of the doubt. We owe them our trust. We're not going to receive a baseless accusation against an elder. And we understand that because of the nature of their work, there are often individuals who would try to harm or to undermine an eldership. If the elders have made a decision, you know, not to go in the direction that someone wanted them to, well, they tried to undermine the eldership. It, it happens, you know, there have been congregations where uh, some of the members wanted to introduce instrumental music into the worship, and the elders said, 
you know, that's not going to happen. And so they, the congregation, there would be members who would literally try to find anything that they could to have those men removed as elders so they could find other men who would go along with their way of thinking and put them in the position as elders so they could have what they wanted. And so they would make baseless accusations against those elders who were standing for the truth. And it's a horrible thing, but it takes place, and it's happened in congregations of God's people. Paul says if there's an accusation, it has to be something that is true and can be verified by two or three witnesses. So you're not just listening to rumor or suspicion or anything like that. You know, it's, it's an actual wrong that has taken place. Now, if an elder sins, he's like any other Christian, and he needs to be rebuked, and Paul says to do that. But at the same time, it has to be a true, genuine sin, not just something that someone has said. The point is we owe them the benefit of the doubt and, and that we, we see the best in them uh, before we just, you know, assume the worst. And then real quick, James 5 and verse 14 reminds us, and again, by the way, I mentioned at the end of this passage in 1 Timothy 5, that it's without partiality, that there's not, you know, prejudice and because of relationships and family ties and those things, uh, those don't influence our decisions toward our elders. We love all and, and honor all and follow all of them. But James 5, 14 tells us this, is any uh, sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And the key thing we want to notice in that verse is that we as the congregation are to call upon the elders. So when we're sick, when we're struggling, you know, physically or spiritually, whatever our need is, they are there for us because they're watching for our souls, and we should call upon them. And then lastly, 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, we are to pray for the elders. Paul says this, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Kings and all that are in authority. There are those that are in authority over us physically in government and things of that nature, but then there are those who are over us spiritually in the church, and that includes the elders. They have oversight over us, and so we need to pray for them, not just on occasions when we're appointing men to serve as elders, but we need to always be praying for them because of the responsibility that they have, of the work that they do, and for what is best for the congregation. Uh, they need to pray for us, and we need to pray for them, just like we all are to pray for one another. But these are some things that we as a congregation owe to the eldership. And I hope that in looking at these things, you know, in, in leading up to uh, this occasion and appointing uh, these two men to, to serve We've talked a lot about elders and what they are to do and their responsibility. I hope that we'll be reminded of our responsibility to them and that we will support them as they support us and that we'll all work together with love in our hearts for the Lord, first of all, that we want his church to be what he wants it to be. We want it to succeed and to grow and to you know, spread through the community and through the world. And so we're going to do our part we're going to follow the leadership of our elders as they follow the leadership of the Lord through his word. And by working together, everyone in his place, doing his part, serving in, in his or her role, we can do great things for the Lord. And I hope that we'll always remember that And as we put God first and do what his word says, we will be successful and ultimately victorious. You know, no matter what the results may be, you know, here on earth and, and on numbers that, you know, we count the attendance or how much money is in the contribution, no matter what those things say, what truly matters is our spiritual victory, that we're doing what is right, that God is pleased with our lives and our service, and that heaven is our eternal home. And that's what it's all about, and that's why we look to God's word, we follow his pattern and his instructions, and with honest, sincere hearts, we seek to serve him according to his will. The office of an elder is essential to the organization of the church, to the work of the church. There are many challenges that are involved in it, but there are also many great rewards 
and the greatest is that uh, eternal reward in heaven. And I hope that we'll all be encouraged to serve the Lord faithfully in, in every part of our lives so we can bring glory to him and live with him forever in heaven. As we close, we have to look at our own lives individually, and we look at these qualifications of elders and realize that that should describe us as Christians as well. And maybe we realize that we're not living in harmony with God's will, and we know we need to make things right with him. The first thing we have to do is to be a Christian, to be a part of his family, to submit to his authority as king of kings and lord of lords. We do that by obeying the gospel. We believe in Jesus as God's son and as our savior, turn from our sins in repentance, confess his name, and then we're baptized for the remission of our sins. And everything is ready and prepared. If there's someone here today who needs to do that, we can help you. You can put on the Lord in baptism, serve faithfully in his son's kingdom from this day forward, and heaven will be your eternal home. If you've done those things initially, but you haven't been faithful and you need to repent of your sins, make them right with God by confessing your wrongs, praying for forgiveness, we'll pray with and for you. We've talked about the power of prayer. One of the greatest blessings God has given us as his children is that we can ask for his forgiveness and he's promised that he'll grant it to us when we come in penitence, acknowledging our wrongs. And if you need to do that, we'll pray with you and for you. And God will do just what he says. He'll forgive. But the Lord's invitation is yours. If you need to respond to it, we encourage you, make that decision. Come forward and do that, even now, as we stand and as we sing. Amen.